Yay, all right. I want to make sure my own mic is on there. Um, coming up next for you is Dr. Amanda Smith from the USF Bird Health Institute, uh, Alzheimer's Institute. God, it's a lot of words. I always mess it up. I'll have it right by the end of the day. Uh, coming up next is Dr. Amanda Smith, a good friend of mine, one of uh, the leading researchers and the medical director uh, of, the, of the Institute at University of South Florida. If you'll give her a big warm welcome, she has some great information for you. Thank you. Thank you. I need to hold something, otherwise I don't know what to do with my hands. <laughs> so hopefully I'll have as much energy as Sean has. I've had some coffee, but it's hard to keep up with his energy. Um, now, normally, you know, I come out here, I come to some of the facilities around and give a caregiver seminar. Um, I have a whole hour long spiel. Today's a very different setup and it's kind of interesting and very fun and very fancy actually. <laughs> Um, but today, I'm really going to focus on one thing that's very new and exciting and has really led our field in a whole new direction. And I'm going to be talking about some of the imaging biomarkers that are now available in Alzheimer's disease. Um, just to kind of give you a comparison. Um, now, I actually really can't see most of you because of all of these lights in my eyes. However, and I don't want to invade your privacy, how many people here take medicine for cholesterol? That's what I thought. So now when you go to the doctor, you go to the lab, you get your cholesterol checked, right? You get the amount back and it tells you what your cholesterol level is, if it's high, if it's low, if it's normal. That's considered a biomarker of cardiovascular disease because they're looking to see if your cholesterol is high, they know that you're at risk for strokes and heart attacks. The ability of us to predict and define Alzheimer's with biomarkers has been lagging quite a bit compared to things like cardiovascular disease. And there's been a lot of advances recently. Now, I know many of you probably saw in the news a couple weeks ago about a blood test for Alzheimer's. Trust me, we got hundreds and hundreds of phone calls saying, I want the blood test for Alzheimer's. Well, you know, that was a research study in a very small group of people that still needs to be validated. So there's no blood test for Alzheimer's yet that you can just go in the office and get. But what's different compared to when I started out in this field is that there is now actually imaging tests for Alzheimer's. Not imaging tests that say maybe you might have it, but this is you know, imaging tests that say yes you do or no you don't. And it's a really, you know, it, it, it set our whole field off in a different direction in terms of looking at. So just to give you a little bit of background about Alzheimer's disease, most people will tell you this today. Hopefully it's not in every talk, but <laughs> it's one of those things. I figured I was early in the day, so I would give you the statistics, so at least I got to give them first. Um, but Alzheimer's is an epidemic in this country. Uh, the number of people with Alzheimer's disease is expected to quadruple by the midpoint of this century. Right now there's over 5 million Americans with it. And by 2050, there's going to be at least 20 million. So. Hopefully, with some of the knowledge that we've acquired, we can do something about that and change that statistic. But even my slide has changed since I made it because very recently there was an article looking back and the best estimate is that Alzheimer's is actually the third leading cause of death in the United States, not the sixth. And I only made this slide about three months ago. So we're really learning what an epidemic it is. It affects 10% of people 65 and above, and almost half of people 85 and above. So age is the biggest risk factor for it. I always like to throw in a little joke. This is you know, what we picture as Alzheimer's, a forgetful little old lady trying to find her way around. Um, but it is no joke. Um, amyloid plaque is felt to be the hallmark of Alzheimer's disease. It is what is accumulating in the brain over time. And I know you're going to hear a little bit more about it later as well. Um, so there's this protein called beta amyloid. Uh, 
and there's some degree of amyloid that's normal in the body, but there's a sort of mutant form of amyloid that accumulates and clumps in the brain and causes cells to die. And that is the hallmark of Alzheimer's disease. It's only found in Alzheimer's disease in this particular state. And for years and years and years, even when I graduated medical school and throughout my residency, the only way to see it in a living patient, what, well, there wasn't one, it was at autopsy, so it was too late to help anybody. You could only see it when you looked at the brain under a microscope. What we know is that this starts to build up in the brain on an average of about 15 years before people ever get the first symptom of forgetfulness. So if somebody starts asking the same questions over and over again when they're 75, it means this started building up probably in their 60s maybe even before. The problem was we didn't know it was there and we couldn't measure it. So, you know, people ask me all the time, you know, can you see the plaque on an MRI? The answer is no. An MRI is a common test that we order all the time to evaluate people with memory loss for a variety of reasons. One is we check to see if there is evidence of stroke, tumor, hydrocephalus or water on the brain or other diseases that can cause dementia because Dementia and Alzheimer's disease are not the same thing. Dementia is a more generic term that describes memory loss plus changes in function and thinking. And there are other things that can cause it. You can get dementia from strokes. You can get dementia from vitamin deficiency. You can get dementia from Parkinson's disease. So there's other things that can cause dementia. But because Alzheimer's is by far the most common, well over half of cases of dementia are due to Alzheimer's, those are often used interchangeably. So we use the MRI in part to rule out other causes of dementia and also to look at a certain part of the brain that tends to shrink in Alzheimer's disease and that's called the hippocampus. Now if you look at the difference between the top picture and the bottom picture, you can see that the bottom picture has more you know, larger black spaces and less of the actual brain tissue the bottom brain is one with Alzheimer's disease and the top one is normal. I didn't know I was gonna be able to reach this, but I can't. <laughs> so if you look over here, you see how all, there's all this black space here and this little tiny thing outlined in red, kind of floating in the breeze there. That's called the hippocampus. It's like if a hippo went to college, they would go to the hippocampus. That's how you remember it. <laughs> <laughs> And that is where new memories are formed. It's highly involved in you know, learning and retaining new information and then sending it off to other parts of the brain where it gets stored. And as you can see, it shrinks quite a bit in Alzheimer's disease, even compared to the shrinking elsewhere. There is, an, a degre there is a degree of normal shrinking of the brain that goes along with aging. But when you see shrinking of the hippocampus, particularly of that degree, that's considered a biomarker of Alzheimer's disease. Now it's not showing us plaque. We can't see the plaque on this scan, but we can see that the hippocampus has shrunken and we can tell this person with a fairly high degree of certainty that Alzheimer's is the reason for their memory loss. This is a structural study. It doesn't tell us anything about how the brain is working. It just it's like a photograph. It shows us a picture of the brain at one point in time. So we have PET scans. Now PET scan, this particular kind of PET scan is called an FDG PET scan. The FDG is basically an acronym for a radioactive type of sugar that gets injected into, a ve into your vein and you lay there for a while and let it circulate and then pictures are taken of the brain to see what areas are functioning properly and what areas are not using that sugar as their fuel. Because sugar, glucose, is the normal fuel for brain cells. And there are very particular patterns that support Alzheimer's disease versus other types of dementing disorders. Now this is a very, very obvious <laughs> set of scans where the one on the left is normal and healthy and the one on the right is not. A normal brain using this kind of PET scan should look like the Florida radar at 4.30 p.m. in July. It should look like where you look and say, oh no, I need my umbrella. <laughs> oh, 
or oh no, I might get struck by lightning. It should be all that red and yellow and orange that shows a lot of activity. Whereas the brain on the right is much quieter. There's a lot of blue, there's a lot of what we call hypometabolism. And in this particular brain, you can see that the sides are the least active. They are using the least amount of glucose normally. And this is a pattern, pardon me, that's very supportive of Alzheimer's disease. The front of the brain, you can see, is kind of light blue. It's less active, but not as poorly active as the sides. When we have, for example, frontotemporal dementia, which is a different kind of dementing disorder where people often have profound behavior changes, embarrassing, impulsive kind of behavior, but their memory is kind of okay, the front part of the brain is the quietest. So this kind of scan also helps us diagnose Alzheimer's disease and is considered a biomarker. But where we have ventured now is into the world of amyloid imaging. If you'll recall, I said that when I started out, you could only see amyloid plaque in a brain at autopsy, and that is not the case anymore. Our colleagues in Pittsburgh started out with the first amyloid imaging agent, which is not FDA approved because it has to be made and used in such a short time. It's really only valuable in research. But Pittsburgh compound B was the first compound to show that amyloid plaque in the brain. And in this case, the brain on the left is the one with Alzheimer's disease. All of that red and yellow is the tracer binding to amyloid plaque. So clearly there's a difference between the, norm, the Alzheimer's brain and the normal brain where there isn't any. A couple of years ago, the FDA approved the first amyloid imaging agent that can be used to diagnose Alzheimer's disease in the clinical setting, and it's called Amivid. Now, the Amivid scan, you know, I know the color, you know, the red and the blue and all that is very exciting. Unfortunately, the Amivid scan, when you read it, is really in black and white. But hopefully you can still see the difference. Amyloid builds up in what we call the cortex. The cortex of the brain is the part of the brain that's closer to your skull. Kind of doesn't make sense that the parts of our brain that do the most and are the most important are closest to our skull, but nevertheless, that's how we were made. But if you look at the top compared to the bottom, you can see that is a positive amyvid scan. So a negative scan and a positive scan in someone who comes into my office who's starting to have memory problems can tell me, yes, they have Alzheimer's because they have plaque in their brain, or no, they don't. Their memory problem is due to something else. So these are a few slides that I pulled from a talk that I sometimes give to doctors. So if there's a lot of fancy language in there, I apologize. However, um, what Amivid does is it estimates how many plaques are present and is interpreted as either being positive or negative. Um, the issue right now, now this is a test that any doctor can order with the right indication. The problem is that Medicare has declined coverage for it. So right now it's an out-of-pocket expense. The cost of an Amivid scan is about anywhere between 3000 to there are some places in the country charging $11,000 for this type of scan, which obviously prohibits many, many people from getting them. But nevertheless, it is available. It's used a lot now in research, and we are actually embarking on research studies that now allow us to see plaque in the brain before people ever have symptoms, and perhaps treat them, and they'll never get symptoms. Uh, I believe you're gonna hear a little bit about that later today from Jill Smith, who's not related to me, um, but is a dear friend and colleague of mine called the A4 study. So I believe she's gonna talk about that later. So I will not steal her thunder. Next slide. So the FDA 
has very specific regulations and recommendations about when an AMIVID scan can be used because it's really important to understand. You know, somebody might be 50 years old and their mother had Alzheimer's disease and they say, well, I want to know if I'm going to get it. I want one of those PET scans. If your mother had later onset Alzheimer's disease, perhaps at 75 or 80 or 85, and you're 50 and you're worried about getting it, if you have a negative AMIVID scan at 50, it doesn't mean you won't have a positive AMIVID scan at 60 because like I said, it starts to build up anywhere between 10 and 20 years before symptoms ever appear. So it's not currently recommended for the worried well for children of Alzheimer's patients until we have something that we can actually do to help them. And there are a lot of things, fortunately, on the horizon for that, but we're not quite there yet. So right now, it's recommended for people who have what we call mild cognitive impairment, which is a state that precedes dementia, where people have definite short-term memory loss, trouble doing some things that they've always done, but they can pretty much get through the day. They're still independent. They can still take care of themselves. They're not demented, as well as people with dementia for which the, the etiology or the reason for the dementia is unclear. And by doing this kind of scan, we can help establish diagnosis, we can help tailor a treatment plan, and we can also, for some people, particularly earlier onset patients who maybe are still working and starting to have memory problems, it can help document disability and get disability benefits by saying, yes, look, they have this amyloid plaque. Alzheimer's is the cause for memory loss in this 54-year-old person. So as I mentioned, AMIVID is not indicated for cognitively normal people yet, because usually when I give a talk like this, then we get lots and lots of phone calls. I want one of those scans. I can't do that yet. Um, a positive scan, now this is what kind of cracks me up. The FDA required Lily, who makes this particular ligand, to say that a positive scan doesn't mean you have Alzheimer's disease. Okay. <laughs> We know that there's nothing else that causes the amyloid to build up in the brain, so we pretty much say, well, if you have a positive scan, you either currently have Alzheimer's or you're going to get it. Um, you know, with a negative scan, we can't guarantee that you're not, but if you've got that plaque, that's pretty much what it's, why it's there. Um, and importantly, it does not exclude people from developing a different kind of dementia. People can get Lewy body disease. People can get frontotemporal dementia. So even if your AMIVID AMI scan is clear, you could still have a different type of dementing disorder that is progressing. Now, literally, within the last week, <laughs> this is new. Um, there are now three PET tracers that are approved to image amyloid. I, I talked about AMIVID because that's the one we use in clinic all the time. There have been two additional ones, uh, Flumetamol, which is made by GE, and Florbetaben, which is made by Pyramel, which literally just got FDA approved last week. Those two are not being marketed yet and used in the clinic, um, but they are also FDA approved. So we we're making a lot of progress, and we're also having uh, new studies looking at imaging tau, which is another kind of protein you'll hear about later. So I hope you've enjoyed this update on some of the new exciting things that we're doing as far as biomarkers and imaging, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much.